So welcome everyone to our fifth Power to the People webinar. Tonight's webinar is The Power of Free Speech. My name is Mark Gage. I'm the Director of Publishing for the Center for Civic Education, and I'll be serving as the facilitator of this event. The webinar will last about an hour and a half until 9 p.m. Eastern. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll get to as many as possible. You can also put them in the chat. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. Our sponsors for Power of the People are the Center for Civic Education, Kansas State University, the Johnson County First Amendment Foundation, and the Indiana Bar Foundation. I just wanna thank all of our sponsors tonight we could not do this event or any of the entire series without you. Thank you so much for your support. And our moderators for tonight are Robert S. Lemming, director of the We the People programs for the Center for Civic Education. And also Tom Vance, director of the Center for Social Studies Education at Kansas State University. And now I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Robert S. Lemming uh, for a few comments, Bob. Thanks, Mark. Uh, good to see you and David and Tommy. Uh, and, and I want a special welcome to all the, the, the teachers out there uh, who are participating tonight. This is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I, it's a sort of a, a, a cornerstone of a free country is free speech. Uh, but we all know it's, there, it's limited to a certain degree. The question is, how is it limited? And is that reasonable limitations? And who limits, government or people themselves? I'm looking forward to, to hearing uh, David Hudson. Uh, he, I've known him for uh, many years and he's been a judge at our national finals uh, uh, many times. Uh, he likes to interact with kids uh, and he likes to interact with teachers. He, he sees himself as a teacher. So I'll turn it over to Tommy for a second to say hello and then we'll get started with David. I just, Bob, you forgot to welcome librarians. Uh, Kate uh, mentioned we, we need to welcome librarians as well. I'm, hey, I'm, I'm looking, and we do, absolutely yeah. do. Hey, uh, I, I'm just really looking forward to a great session with, um, uh, with David Hudson. And, um, and uh, here he is uh, four blocks away from uh, the debate, uh, tonight's debate. I'm looking forward to a great evening uh, of speech, uh, both learning about free speech from uh, Professor Hudson and, and watching uh, speech in action as I flip through the uh, various channels and, uh, and see what they make of the, the debate. So, uh, Looking for, forward to a great night. Thank you so much uh, for coming. All right, uh, thank you so much for that, Tommy. And now let me introduce uh, Professor Hudson. Uh, David L. Hudson Jr. is a First Amendment expert and law professor who serves as First Amendment fellow for Freedom Forum. He contributes research and commentary and provides analysis and information to news media. He is an author, co-author, and co-editor of more than 40 books, including Let the Students Speak, A History of the Fight for Free Expression in American Schools, and The Encyclopedia of the First Amendment. Professor Hudson has written several books devoted to student speech issues and other areas of student rights. He writes regularly for the ABA Journal and the American Bar Association's Preview of United States Supreme Court Cases. He has served as a senior law clerk at the Tennessee Supreme Court and teaches First Amendment and professional responsibility classes at Vanderbilt University School of Law and various classes at the Nashville School of Law. Welcome, Professor Hudson, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Thank you, over to you. Well, thanks so much. It's really uh, quite an honor to be able to, to speak to you about the First Amendment. I agree with, with Bob that the First Amendment really is the cornerstone of a of a free society. And we know that the First Amendment represents the first 45 words of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. This amendment really is the amendment that gives us the right to criticize government officials, to advocate for societal change, 
to express our discontent with various aspects of society and frankly to pursue our particular passions of, of individual liberty and individual proclivities. A couple points that I want to make first off about the, about the uh, First Amendment is that the First Amendment itself says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. What we know about that is that early on it was determined that the First Amendment limited not just Congress, but it limited all three branches of the federal government. And then we know through a series of Supreme Court decisions, beginning in 1925 with Gitlow versus New York, that the United States Supreme Court incorporated the various First Amendment freedoms. They incorporated the Free Speech Clause in 1925 in Gitlow, the Free Press Clause in 31 in Near V, Minnesota, um, the Free Exercise Clause with Cantwell versus Connecticut in 1940, et cetera, et cetera. So now when we look at the First Amendment, it says Congress shall make no law. What it really means is that no federal, state, or local government official shall make any law. And that's an important distinction that I think sometimes students can lose sight of. And it also shows the importance of the 14th Amendment and the power of the Due Process Clause in the sense that freedom of speech certainly is an important aspect of liberty within the meaning of the Due Process Clause. When we look at the, the First Amendment as well, what we also see is that there is something known as the state action doctrine in constitutional law. And the state action doctrine essentially means that only governmental actors can violate our First Amendment rights. And the United States Supreme Court created the state action doctrine in a series of five cases that collectively went up to the US Supreme Court that were known as the civil rights cases. One of those incidentally arose from my home state of Tennessee and Memphis, Tennessee involved a lady named Sally Robinson who was traveling from Missouri with her nephew and was not allowed to sit in the railway car even though she had purchased a first class ticket. And what the United States Supreme Court held in the civil rights cases was that the 14th amendment was only concerned with individual invasions of uh, individual invasions of liberty by government, uh, not private actors, so that private acts of discrimination were not prohibited by the 14th Amendment. And the reason I mention that is that the state action doctrine is a bit in flux. If we look at the US Supreme Court's 2019 decision in the Manhattan versus Halleck case, we see a United States Supreme Court split five to four in the court essentially holding that the state action doctrine is still a vibrant part of constitutional law. And the reason why I think that's significant is that there are large, powerful private entities in society. Uh, for example, powerful social media platforms like Google and Facebook who are not limited by the, by the First Amendment. Um, you'll hear, you may hear in a, another talk tonight about Section 230, that's certainly come up, that's referring to uh, 47 USC Section 230, uh, part of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, that essentially holds that an interactive service provider cannot be held liable for the speech of a third party, that they are not the publisher of that. But when talking about this with my students, they sometimes don't appreciate being censored on social media and they don't understand how it is that a local sheriff or a local city official can be bound by the First Amendment, but a super powerful private entity is, is not bound by the First Amendment. Uh, it's still censorship, but it's not technically a constitutional violation. So there are some doctrines out there if there's a close enough relationship between a private actor and a governmental actor, there still can be, uh, can still be state action. Now, the next part I want to talk about, having a little trouble with my screen here. Professor Sorry. Hudson, uh, do you, do you want to share your slideshow or would you like me to share it? 
Oh, yes. Could you share that? I'm sorry. I can do that. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry about that. You should be seeing it shortly. OK, sorry about that. There you go. Is, is that visible? Yes. OK, great. I'm just a little bit locked up. Yeah. So now when we talk about the First Amendment, let's get down to the nitty gritty here. There are five textual based freedoms in the First Amendment. The first 16 words of the First Amendment are the freedom of religion clauses. Those include the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. With the about to be new composition of the United States Supreme Court, this is the area that may be, uh, may have the greatest potential for change over the next several years, uh, given that Judge Barrett perhaps will become Justice Barrett and has replaced uh, Justice Ginsburg. The Establishment Clause, the first 10 words of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. It's one that uh, deeply divides justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and it's one that has been a very powerful force in school litigation through the years. Uh, for example, can the public school have a picture of Jesus in the hallway of the school assembly? Um, can a person give a prayer at a middle school graduation? Uh, can a teacher in any way participate in religious activities of a student club, right? We know that the Establishment Clause erects a, some sort of degree of uh, what uh, Justice Black, referring to Thomas Jefferson's 1802 letter to the Nanbury Baptist, erects a wall of separation between church and state and in Everson versus Board of Education, Justice Black wrote that that wall must be kept high and impregnable. But exactly how high is the Establishment Clause? Uh, there certainly have been some decisions by the United States Supreme Court. If we look at Zellman versus Simmons-Harris in 2002, where a 5-4 U.S. Supreme Court upheld an Ohio school voucher program that involved state money flowing to about 96% religious schools, right? Justice Souter wrote a pretty vigorous dissent in that case saying that amounted to the government advancing religion. The second religious liberty clause, of course, is the free exercise clause. That's the part of the First Amendment that gives us absolute protection for uh, freedom of belief. We can believe whatever we want. We can believe a majoritarian religion. We can believe a, a or no religion at all, right? It, it protects the fiercely devout and the fiercely atheistic. And then we come to the four freedoms that collectively are generally known as freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and freedom of petition. There is one other freedom that is protected by the First Amendment, even though its terminology is not mentioned in the text, and that is the freedom of association. So in 1958, in NAACP versus Alabama, the United States Supreme Court held that the state of Alabama could not force the NAACP to disclose its private membership list so that members of the organization could be harassed and lose their jobs um, because officials wanted to drive the NAACP out of the state. Uh, so we do see some freedom of association and the converse of that the freedom not to associate, that's also protected by the First Amendment. Now, when we turn to freedom of speech, and as Bob said, it's the cornerstone of a free society, why is it so important? In other words, why do we protect uh, freedom of speech so much? I mean, in certain instances, we are an outlier in the world community. We protect a lot of hateful expression that frankly could be criminalized in other countries around the globe. There are several reasons that have been offered as to why we protect free speech so much, but one is essentially what Bob said. It's absolutely essential to a free society. How can we be free as a people? How can we the people be free if we don't have the ability to criticize the government? You know, if we go back to Justice William Brennan's famous words in New York Times Company versus Sullivan in 1964, that we must understand the First Amendment in light of a profound national commitment 
that debate on public issues should be robust, uninhibited, and wide open. It may well include sharp, vehement, and unpleasantly sharp attacks upon public officials. That really is the essence of, of freedom. But we also protect the First Amendment in part because it allows us to fully maximize our potential as individuals. It gives us a maximization of individual choice. It allows us to reach, uh, I guess, Abraham Maslow's uh, self-actualization, that there are certain things that are important to me as a human being, even, if, even though they may not contribute to the larger body politic. The First Amendment also allows us to participate in uh, the operation of our government. So with a, with a nod to Alexander Mickeljohn and several other famous First Amendment theorists, right? It contributes to the idea of a democratic self-government. And then the First Amendment also allows people to blow off steam, frankly. If we go back to Justice Louis Brandeis's famous concurring opinion in Whitney v. California in 1927. He said many things in that, uh, in that opinion, but one of them is, if there be time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies, to avert the evils by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. When we as a society are confronted with harmful speech, we have to counter it with positive speech. And why do we need to do that? We need to allow people to blow off steam, even if their speech is harmful or repugnant. As John Stuart Mill uh, wrote in On Liberty, it allows us a clearer perception of why our speech is correct, but it also prohibits people, instead of blowing off steam, they may go underground and enact in a, in a very violent manner, right? Justice Anthony Kennedy, who served on the United States Supreme Court, I believe from 1988 until his recent retirement, in 2002 in a case called Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition, also said that the reason why we protect speech so much is because it's inextricably intertwined with freedom of thought, right? How are we going to protect free speech um, or how are we going to protect individuals' rights to think for themselves if we don't allow them to articulate those ideas, right? And so what he says is speech is the beginning of thought, and that's why it counts more than other sorts of, of activities that are also protected. You know, one of the great heroes of the First Amendment is none other than Thurgood Marshall. And when we think about Justice Marshall, we generally laud him for his extraordinary record as an advocate uh, before the United States Supreme Court. I think in private practice, he won 29 of 31 or 32 cases that he argued before the Supreme Court. He became the first African American to serve as United States Solicitor General in 1965, and he won, I think, 14 out of 18 cases in that role. Um, when President Johnson elevated him to the United States Supreme Court in 1967, um, he served on the U.S. Supreme Court till his retirement in, in 90 or 91, I think it was. But one of the things about Thurgood Marshall was his consistent defense of First Amendment freedoms. He was as consistent a defender of the First Amendment as almost anyone who's ever sat on the United States Supreme Court. And in 1969, in Stanley versus Georgia, he wrote this statement here, our entire constitutional heritage rebels at the thought of giving government the power to control men's minds. And if the First Amendment means anything, it means that the government cannot tell a person what books they may read or what movies they may watch in the privacy of their own home. That, to me, speaks very passionately about why the First Amendment is so important in our society. Now, if we dig a little bit, a little bit deeper into evaluating speech and determining when the power of the free speech clause is implicated, the first step often is to determine whether something even constitutes speech. In other words, speech involves far more than just the spoken word or 
words printed on a page. We know that if we go out and speak, let's say intemperately at a police officer and arrested, that's speech within the meaning of the First Amendment. We know that if we hand out a, a leaflet and act as a pamphleteer and then are punished for the content of that expression, right, that speech. But there are various forms of so-called expressive conduct that also trigger the protections of the free speech clause. And the United States Supreme Court really at least implicitly adopted this in 1931 in a case called Stromberg versus California, where 19 year old Yetta Stromberg was a counselor at a communist youth party camp. And she was punished for displaying a red flag, which was a symbol intimately associated with the communist party. And in Chief Justice Charles Evan Hughes' opinion, he essentially finds implicitly that her act of displaying the red flag was a form of free speech. In 1989, the United States Supreme Court decided another flag case, one that frankly is far more controversial. It involved the free speech expression of one Gregory Lee Johnson, who burned an American flag in Dallas, Texas, outside of the Republican National Convention. As many people chanted, America, red, white, and blue, we spit on you. Johnson was prosecuted for violating a Texas flag desecration law. And in the midst of deciding the case, it goes up to the United States Supreme Court. It also was a 5-4 decision in favor of Johnson. The court adopted what is known as the Spence test, coming from an earlier flag case, uh, Spence versus Washington in 1974, it said in order to determine whether something is expressive enough to provide First Amendment protection, we have to ask first whether there is an intent to convey a particularized message. And even if there is an intent to convey a particularized message, it has to be a message that would likely be understood by the, by the audience. Ultimately, the court said that Gregory Lee Johnson's act of burning the American flag, as repugnant as it was, was certainly expressive enough to trigger the protections of the free speech clause. So question, uh, is this speech, right? Um, in public schools, we have dress codes, at least at many of them, some of them we have school uniform policies. Young people oftentimes uh, don't like to conform to the particular sartorial preferences of adults. Um, and in many jurisdictions, there are uh, school dress code policy provisions that prohibit the wearing of sagging pants, right? We don't want people showing off the posteriors or perhaps tripping over themselves, right? Is this a form of free speech? This actually was a, a live issue in a federal district court in New Mexico, where a young man had been disciplined on three separate occasions for violating his school dress code because he kept wearing sagging pants. Now, he argued that his act of wearing sagging pants was a very important way for him to support hip hop culture and to express his individual preferences. And the reviewing federal district court judge applied the two-part test from Spence v. Washington and Texas v. Johnson and said, well, was the young man uh, conveying a particularized message? And they said, well, maybe, uh, but even if so, it's not one that would likely be understood. So we're uh, not going to find that his act of wearing sagging pants is something that triggers the protection of the free speech clause. Contrast that with uh, tattoos. You know, when I was at the First Amendment Center, we used to have a moot court competition where we would bring in anywhere from 32 to 40 teams from different law schools across the country. And in 2012, our problem involved a situation where a local municipality sought to essentially outlaw uh, tattoo parlors and severely restrict what, what they could do. Early cases uh, across the country found that a tattoo itself was not a form of free speech protected by the First Amendment. Rather, these courts referred to it merely as the injection of dye into skin. We'll contrast that with some of the later decisions. I'm thinking of Anderson versus City of Hermosa Beach uh, 
I'm thinking of the Burlau case before the 11th Circuit. What these various lower court decisions have held is that people are expressing some of their most powerful feelings through their tattoos. Uh, through tattoos, we often mourn um, the loss of a loved one. We advocate political or religious messages, or we express our individual liberty through various artistic source, uh, sources or things. In other words, tattoos represent what are referred to as our, as our arts of life, and they certainly qualify as, as speech. But in the state of Indiana, the home state of, of, of Bob Lemming, there was a case that I wrote about a few years ago where a man refused to cut his grass and local officials were quite upset about it and the neighbors kept calling and complaining saying this guy won't cut his grass. And so he received several citations. Well, the man argued in court that his act of not cutting his grass was a form of free speech, was a form of protest against the overly authoritarian local government officials who were forcing him to do something with his own yard. Uh, the reviewing court said, no, that's not a form of free speech protected by the First Amendment. There's a case in the state of Minnesota involving a man who was very upset at his local city council member. And so when the local city council member came out of the, the council hall, he threw a pie in his face and hit him. Well, we know that to be assault and battery under traditional law, but the man offered forth a free speech defense. He said his act of throwing the pie in the face of the individual was really a form of political protest. And once again, the court said, no, that's not a form of free speech. So oftentimes what I'm getting at is a lot of our most interesting free speech questions involve, does the free speech clause apply at all to these to these instances. Um, remember that there are many activities that have an expressive element. What Justice William Rehnquist referred to in Dallas versus City of Stanglin in 1989, excuse me, then Chief Justice William Rehnquist, he said there are a lot of things that have a so-called kernel of free expression, but they're not expressive enough to trigger full First Amendment review. That case involved a social hall dancing in the, in the city of Dal uh, Dallas. And the court said simply that's not expressive enough to trigger First Amendment review. Now returning to the text of the 45 words, it says Congress shall make no law, dot, 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 abridging the freedom of speech. And that certainly means that most speech in society is protected. But we know that not all speech is protected. No law really doesn't mean no law. In other words, there are certain narrow categories of unprotected speech. Some of the most common are obscenity, uh, fighting words, what the US Supreme Court defined in Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire as words which by their very utterance inflict injury or cause an immediate breach of the peace incitement to imminent lawless action. The We the People text actually cites that case, Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969. We don't have a First Amendment right to perjure ourselves in court. We don't have a First Amendment right to extort money from another person. We don't even have a First Amendment right to engage in false advertising. False advertising or false commercial speech is not protected by the First Amendment. So a good part of the development of First Amendment law is determining whether speech falls into one of these narrow, unprotected categories of speech. Some of the others, true threats, right? In 1969, in Watts versus United States, a 19-year-old African-American protester by the name of Robert Watts was protesting the Vietnam War. There was a a strong contingent of society who believed that the United States government was sending far too many young African-American youth to die overseas. And what Robert Watts said was something to the fact if, 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 El, if I could ever get him within the scope of my rifle, right, the first person that I would shoot is LBJ. I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that's what he was saying. It was more of a joke 
Uh, it was more of a political hyperbole than it was a true threat. But unfortunately for young Mr. Watts, there was a uh, Secret Service person nearby uh, who heard that, and Mr. Watts got prosecuted for violating 18 U.S.C. 871, which is still the federal statute that prohibits threats against the president and other federal government officials. And the United States Supreme Court recognized that something that is truly a true threat is not protected by the First Amendment, but we have to make sure that we don't um, take a lot of speech that really isn't truly threatening and punishing it, right? Because we have to distinguish between what is a true threat and what is protected speech. That's certainly something that's also at issue in the public schools. When public school officials punish a student for, let's say, a violent themed poem that they write. And the question becomes, is that poem really a true threat or is it really a form of artistic freedom and therefore protected by the First Amendment? Libel or defamation, right? Um, a false statement of fact that harms our reputation. Defamation is a form of speech that's not protected. But we know that in 1964, in Times v. Sullivan, the United States Supreme Court essentially constitutionalized libel law, right? Way back in 1964, the United States Supreme Court referenced specifically the Sedition Act of 1798 and talked about how that law was a real affront to First Amendment values and did not carry the day in history. There are other categories of speech like commercial speech and so-called indecent speech that are not wholly unprotected categories of speech, but they can be limited to a certain degree. So commercial speech itself was not even protected by the United States Supreme Court until 1976. I always tell my students, uh, let's take the example of attorney advertising, right? We can't go anywhere without seeing attorneys advertise their services. Well, it turns out that Abraham Lincoln advertised his services in his law firm in 1853, but it wasn't until 1977 in Bates versus State Bar of Arizona that the United States Supreme Court first ruled that at least certain forms of truthful attorney advertising were protected by the First Amendment. This notion of indecent speech, you know, it, it brings to mind Justice John Marshall Harlan's famous statement in Cohen v. California in 1971, quote, one man's vulgarity is another's lyric. You know, what may be indecent to me may be decent to you or vice versa. But the reality is in certain contexts, the United States government can prohibit indecent speech. After all, that's what Bethel School District versus Frazier, the 1986 decision by the United States Supreme Court essentially is. It allows public school officials to prohibit student speech that is vulgar or lewd. So a lot of what we have to do, in essence, is determine whether speech falls into these unprotected categories. Now, when talking about this with students, I always like to incorporate a little bit of history. And we go back to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. It was his great dissenting opinion in Abrams versus United States in 1919 that is referred to in the First Amendment community as the Great Dissent. But earlier in 1919, it was Justice Holmes who wrote the majority opinion in Schenck versus United States, upholding the convictions of Charles Schenck and Elizabeth Baer for essentially doing nothing more than engaging in dissident political speech. And Justice Holmes was looking for analogy for the basic point that the First Amendment doesn't protect anything. And his, and his most uh, famous phrase, even more than clear and present danger, was this one. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. It's that shouting fire analogy that has entered our cultural pantheon and is something that gets bandied about in political discourse. Those of you, I think I saw a few names in the audience, those of you that know me well, know of my strong passion for the sport of boxing, the sweet science. And one example that seems to resonate with students is when I tell them about the youngest man to ever win the World Heavyweight Championship, one Michael Gerard Tyson. 
who's going to be fighting November 28th against Roy Jones Jr. in an eight-round exhibition that I'm very much looking forward to. But the reason I mention this, uh, mention this, it has a direct First Amendment connection. When Mike Tyson was at a press conference and he had said some awful things about his opponent, I think he was talking about one Donovan Razor Ruddick, who was a very rugged contender who Mike Tyson fought twice in his career. And a reporter actually asked Mike Tyson the question, said, Mike, why are you saying all these terrible things about the man? After all, he's a fellow pugilist. Why are you saying these things? And Mike Tyson's response was, it's not like I was shouting fire in a theater or something, right? Mike Tyson in his time in an Indiana prison, where he spent, I think, three and a half years, did a lot of reading. And somewhere along the way, he came across uh, Justice Holmes' famous, famous phrase. Now, when we're talking about these unprotected categories of speech, we have to give credit to the Roberts Court. It's customary at constitutional law circles to refer to the United States Supreme Court by particular time periods based on the last name of the sitting Chief Justice. And I think there have been 17 Chief Justices in our history. The Roberts Court, and this is one of the hallmark principles of the Roberts Court, has been its reluctance to create new unprotected categories of speech. And it's done so in four separate cases. In 2010, in United States versus Stevens, the United States Supreme Court refused to recognize a separate exception for speech that constitutes images of animal cruelty. In 2011, in Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association, the United States Supreme Court ruled that violent video games were not a separate unprotected category of speech. In fact, in Justice Antonin Scalia's majority opinion, he said, look, Grimm's fairy tales are indeed quite grim. In 2012, the United States Supreme Court decided a case Snyder versus Phelps that involved the noxious, repugnant speech of the Westboro Baptist Church. The now deceased Fred Phelps, who was a disbarred lawyer, he and his various family members would go around the country and protest at, the, at military funerals. And they protested at the funeral of one uh, slain Marine, uh, Mr., Mr. Snyder. His father, Mr. Snyder's father, filed a tort lawsuit for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And one of the arguments in the case was, well, protesting at somebody's funeral is a form of free speech that should not be protected. And the United States Supreme Court resisted that as well. And then in 2012 as well, in United States versus Alvarez, the United States Supreme Court refused to recognize a categorical exception for so-called false speech even though one Xavier Alvarez was an inveterate liar and even had the temerity to lie about whether he had earned military honors. The court said, look, that's going to be too, too fine a, a line to draw and it's going to lead to the suppression of a lot of, a lot of speech. The important thing that I want to convey about this concept, what I refer to as categorization in First Amendment law, is that these categories have significantly narrowed over time. If we think about obscenity, uh, yeah, I have this one slide here of Justice Potter Stewart in 1964 and his uh, concurring opinion, Jacobellus versus Ohio, he famously wrote, I know it when I see it. He actually later lamented that that would be his epigraph. And that's sort of a shame because Justice Potter Stewart, like uh, Thurgood Marshall, was a pretty consistent defender of First Amendment freedoms. But the United States Supreme Court struggled mightily through the years to determine what actually constitutes obscenity. And the important thing to realize about these areas, and ultimately what the Burger Court did is it gave us this test, uh, uh, whether speech appeals predominantly to a purient or shameful interest in sex, whether it depicts or describes sexual or excretory matters in a patently offensive way, or whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Uh, that's a lot of you know, legal terminology there, but that's a far cry from prosecuting booksellers who sell D.H. Lawrence novels, which is something that happened in the time of Comstockery, 
uh, when Anthony Comstock and the New York suppression of vice was advocating for the suppression of all sorts of speech. Incidentally, that last prong of, Mil of the Miller test, one thing that I've been able to resonate with students uh, in, in various talks with them is it's not just speech that we would traditionally think of a vicinity that sometimes gets prosecuted. And the example I'm thinking of is the Navarro case, Navarro versus the two life crew in, in Florida, where Sheriff Nick Navarro sought to shut down and suppress the, uh, the uh, distribution of the two live crew's most um, commercially successful album, as nasty as they want to be. He actually advocated that this thing was obscene and should be banned from public discourse and not sold in record stores. Well, Luther Campbell, who was the lead rapper of Two Live Crew, actually files a, an action in federal district court seeking a declaratory judgment that his album was not legally obscene within the meaning of the First Amendment. A federal district court judge in Florida actually listened to the music and held that it was obscene and could be banned. That case was appealed to the 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. And the 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals heard the fact that Luther Campbell and his lawyers had put forth the testimony of four separate expert witnesses who testified that this album actually had serious artistic value and therefore could not be prosecuted as obscenity. Important thing again, is that these narrow unprotected categories have become even narrower over time. And that's been a significant development for the expansion of free speech in society. Now let's turn our attention to uh, commercial speech because we live in a society that is a commercial culture, right? And in 1942 in Valentine versus Christensen, the United States Supreme Court really out of thin air said purely commercial advertising is not protected speech at all. In other words, the constitution does not impose any limitations on it. Finally, in 1980, well, first in 1976 in Virginia Pharmacy, the court rejected that and said that the free flow of commercial information can be as important or more important sometimes to people than the most urgent political debates at the time. But in 1980, in the Central Hudson case, the court essentially gave commercial speech second class status in our free society. Traditionally, in First Amendment law, so-called content-based restrictions on speech are evaluated under strict scrutiny. And strict scrutiny means the most vigorous form of judicial review that we have in constitutional law. And usually strict scrutiny means that the law is invalidated, although not always. But essentially what the United States Supreme Court did is we're gonna give the government greater leeway to regulate advertising than other forms of non-commercial speech. And the reason I present this to you today is that's one of the significant issues in modern times for First Amendment jurisprudence, because there's a movement by a lot of advocates in society, does it really make sense that commercial speech should still receive second class status in our society? Um, let's turn now to special settings. You know, when I talk to my students about First Amendment law, I, I talk about the different C's. I talk about category, context, and content. We've talked about categorization already, whether speech falls into an unprotected category. But arguably just as important is how much is speech limited by its context? And what I mean by context is the status of the speaker. It's, it's just a fact that when the government acts as educator, as employer, as commander in chief, or as warden, the government has greater power to restrict speech than it does when the government acts as sovereign. Stated another way, public school students, public employees, inmates, and members of the military do not have the same level of free speech rights as adults generally do in free society. And the question is, is that fair? 
does that make sense? Do public employees have a sufficient level of free speech rights in society? I would contend that they do not. Do public school students have a sufficient level of First Amendment rights in society? At least in many instances, I don't think that they do. I mentioned earlier that the, the Roberts Court was fairly protective of free speech when it comes to creating uh, resisting the impulse by the government to create new unprotected categories of speech. In this area, the Roberts Court falls short. When, with regard to public employment, the Roberts Court decided Garcetti versus Ceballos, 2006. In that case, the court created a categorical rule. When public employees make statements pursuant to their official job duties, the Constitution does not insulate them from discipline. In other words, when public employees make statements to their official job duties, the First Amendment doesn't protect them. It doesn't matter how important the speech is. It doesn't matter if it's the purest of whistleblowers. If the public employee engaged in official job duty speech, no First Amendment protection. Well, how does that apply to a public school teacher? A few lower courts have applied the Garcetti test so broadly to hold that any speech by a public school teacher in the classroom is official job duty speech, and therefore they don't have protection. Public school students. In 1969, we know that the United States Supreme Court decided the great Tinker case, Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School District. When Justice Abe Fortas writing for the court Quote, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. That students are not, the schools are not enclaves of totalitarianism. That students are not closed circuit recipients for only that speech that school officials wish to impart to them. That undifferentiated fear or apprehension of disturbance is not enough to overcome the right to freedom of expression. But the reality is, is that in a post-Tinker environment, the United States Supreme Court has created so-called Tinker carve-outs. The first one was in 1986 in the aforementioned Bethel School District versus Frazier. Matthew Frazier gave a speech before the 600 students at Bethel High School nominating Jeff Kuhlman for student vice president. And he did so in, a, I guess, one could view as an immature manner. He, made a lot of statements that had a sort of sexual uh, entendre to them that Matt Frazier will pound at home, will take it to the climax, et cetera, et cetera. It created some giggles in the audience of students, but no real disruption. What's the, what's the test from the Tinker case, right? Way back in 1969, the court said, look, John, uh, Mary Beth Tinker, John Tinker, Christopher Eckhart, and a couple other students uh, did not create a substantial disruption at school. In fact, school officials couldn't even reasonably forecast that their speech would cause a substantial disruption. It was passive political speech. Well, the seven member majority in Bethel School District versus Frazier said that, that the political speech at Tinker was different than the sexual speech that Matthew Frazier offered. Igno conveniently ignoring the fact that Matthew Frazier actually was giving a political speech. After all, he was nominating a fellow student for elective office. But the cr court created a new rule that public officials can prohibit student speech if it's vulgar, lewd, or plainly offensive. Two years later, the United States Supreme Court decides Hazelwood School District versus Kuhlmeyer involving a case involving the suppression of two articles from the Spectrum, the school newspaper. One dealt with the impact of divorce upon teens and the other dealt with teen pregnancy. And Principal Robert Eugene Reynolds felt simply that these articles were inappropriate, particularly for 13 and 14 year old students. And ultimately the case goes up to the United States Supreme Court and the court rules five to three in favor of the school and it creates a new rule Quote, educators do not offend the First Amendment by exercising editorial control of the style and content of school-sponsored expressive activities when their reasons for doing so are reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical concerns. In other words, the court injected rational basis into the analysis and said as long as an educator had a legitimate, reasonable reason for censoring the student's speech, it could do so. Now, where did that standard come from? 
ironically enough. Well, it arguably came from a case decided one year uh, earlier, Turner versus Safley. Turner versus Safley involved a prison inmate named Leonard Safley who fell in love with a female inmate. When prison officials found the two had some sort of connection, the female inmate got transferred to another penal institution. Well, what happens is Leonard Safley wants to send her love letters and then they also want to get married. The Missouri Department of Corrections had policies that prohibited inmates from marrying one another and also from inmates marry, uh, sending mail or correspondence from one penal institution to another. Ultimately, the case reaches the United States Supreme Court and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor writing for the court said that prison officials do not impinge on the constitutional rights of inmates if their reasons for doing so are reasonably related to legitimate penological concerns. So one year later, the standard is not reasonably related to legitimate penological concerns, it's reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical concerns. Ergo, public school students have the same level of free speech rights of prison inmates. That's why the Hazelwood decision is reviled in many circles of First Amendment law. It's why great states like Kansas have um, a so-called anti-Hazelwood law that provides greater statutory protection of free speech than the United States Supreme Court provided in its 1988 Hazelwood decision. Justice William Brennan, writing in dissent, actually accused the majority of, quote, brutal censorship. Then in uh, 2007, we got the aforementioned Morse versus Frederick, AKA bong hits for Jesus, where the United States Supreme Court created yet another tinker carve out. That public school officials can prohibit student speech that they reasonably believe advocates the illegal use of drugs. Now that was a negative decision by the Roberts Court. It further limited the free speech rights of public school students. But there was a golden nugget in that case that bears mention. None other than Ken Starr of uh, independent prosecutor Clinton fame, also a former federal appellate court judge, argued pro bono for school officials. One of his primary arguments was that public school officials, including Principal Deborah Morse, ought to be able to prohibit Joseph Frederick's speech because it's plainly offensive under Frazier. Well, a lot of conservative political and religious groups actually filed amicus briefs in support of Joseph Frederick, not because they particularly supported bong hits for Jesus, they didn't even know what it meant. But what they said was, if we allow public school officials to prohibit any student speech because it's offensive, that's going to allow for the rank suppression, frankly, of a lot of conservative political and religious speech. And Chief Justice Roberts bought that argument. And in his opinion, he said that that argument stretches Frazier too far. Therefore, essentially, he excised out the plainly offensive part of the Frazier test. Suffice it to say, in Morse versus Frederick, the United States Supreme Court was not terribly protective of free speech. Um, now, the Roberts Court was also not protective of public school speech in Garcetti v. Ceballos in 2006. I've already talked about that terribly breathtaking uh, rule. That was also a 5-4 decision. In 2014, the Roberts Court decided a case called Lane versus Franks, in which they held that a public employee did have a First Amendment right to testify truthfully in court and not be retaliated against for that truthful testimony. The reason because it was not part of that employee's regular job duties to go and testify in court. Now there's another concept that we need to talk about and that is the so-called public forum doctrine. And the public forum doctrine has come back into vogue essentially because a lot of people say that the information superhighway and the internet and the speech that takes place online is akin to a public forum in which there should be heightened First Amendment protections. Well, the public forum doctrine is traced all the way back to the Supreme Court's 1939 decision in Hague versus CIO, in which Justice Owen Roberts talks about the fact that the public streets have been held since time immemorial in public trust 
for the public to use to exercise free speech rights. And so today in modern society, when we evaluate various restrictions on public property, oftentimes we determine the level of free speech protection by determining what is the designation or label that we place upon that public place. Is it a traditional public forum, like a public park or a public street? Is it a designated public forum that a governmental entity has opened up for expression on particular topics? Or is it a non-public forum? For example, public streets right, right outside of a post office or teacher mailboxes in a public school. It does matter what label is placed upon space in First Amendment cases. Now, uh, we've talked now about category and we've talked about uh, context. It's also important to talk about content. It is the leading methodological principle in modern First Amendment law. It was expressed most notably by Justice Marshall in Chicago Police Department versus Mosley in 1972. It's what I refer to my students as the miscellaneous quote. Above all else, the First Amendment means the government may not restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. The government may not restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. What this means is that we view laws that are content-based or viewpoint-based with greater suspicion than so-called content-neutral laws. Why? It goes back to thought control. It goes back to what Justice Marshall said in Stanley versus Georgia. We don't want the government telling us what to think. We don't want the government telling us what to say. That is the special concern of the First Amendment. One way to evaluate this in modern society is when we look at a law, ask ourselves, did the government adopt this restriction because it disagrees with the message? If the government adopted a law because it disagrees with a particular message, there's a very strong argument that that law is content-based or viewpoint-based and if it is, it's presumptively unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Justice Anthony Kennedy at times said, content-based restrictions on pure political speech are flatly unconstitutional. The only other justice who's really said that at times was William O. Douglas, who served on the United States Supreme Court longer than any other justice. I believe he served on the court from 1939 until 1974, 75, 36 years he served on the US Supreme Court. That's not what the current United States Supreme Court does. The current United States Supreme Court says, if a law is content-based, we apply strict scrutiny. If a law is content neutral, we apply intermediate scrutiny. Sometimes it's very, very hard to determine whether a law is content-based or content neutral in society. But in 2015, in Reed versus Town of Gilbert, we saw a deep division in the United States Supreme Court, even though all nine justices said that an Arizona, Arizona sign law was patently unconstitutional. But it really depends upon whether a law or ordinance draws facial distinctions on speech. If it does, then it's content-based. It doesn't necessarily mean it's unconstitutional. There have been times when the Roberts Court has found that a content-based law is actually constitutional, but it does mean that we approach that law with a little greater vigor. Um, there is a special type of content regulation that I did want to spend a little bit of time on, and that is compelled speech. The government you know, oftentimes when we think of the First Amendment, we think of speaker speaks and then is punished. Speaker speaks intemperately or obnoxiously or repugnantly and then somehow is punished. But the point of the compelled speech doctrine is that the First Amendment often also prohibits the government from compelling us to engage in certain speech. And where did the compelled speech doctrine come from? 
It came from West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, decided on Flag Day, June 14, 1943. When Justice Robert Jackson wrote, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, is that no official higher petty shall prescribe what should be orthodox in matters of politics, nationalism, or religion. That's an important principle today because we have laws in society that arguably compel people to engage in certain speech. If we have a direct restriction on speech that compels speech, that is just as much a First Amendment problem as a direct content-based limitation on speech. There is a huge exception to the content discrimination principle and it's of relatively recent vintage. And it's something called the government speech doctrine. And the idea behind the government speech doctrine is that the government has the right to be an active market participant. The government can say, just say no to drugs and doesn't have to subsidize, um, smoke it up. Uh, the government can advocate against cigarettes and doesn't have to subsidize any speech that is pro-tobacco. The important point to remember here is that if speech is truly classified as government speech, that's the end of the First Amendment analysis. In other words, under the government speech doctrine, the government can engage in viewpoint discrimination. We saw that with a 2015 case, Walker versus Sons of Confederate Veterans, where the division of the Sons of Confederate Veterans in Texas applied for a specialty license plate. The Texas uh, Department of Motor Vehicles denied them the right to the license plate. Why did they do so? They said that the Confederate flag is an offensive image to many, many people in the state, and we as the state don't wanna be associated with that symbol. Five members of the United States Supreme Court ruled that specially licensed plates were a form of government speech in the state of Texas could shut that down. Last uh, major topic I'll talk about are three sort of uh, significant principles of constitutional law that apply with special force in First, in First Amendment jurisprudence. The overbreath doctrine, the vagueness doctrine, and the doctrine of prior restraint. Look, government officials, when they pass laws, have to be sure that they don't write laws too broadly. Because if they write laws too broadly, then they do more than punish prescribable speech. They also prohibit speech that ought to be protected. Its cousin is the so-called vagueness doctrine, right? A law is unconstitutionally vague if we don't know if we're violating or not. Key example is the Communications Decency Act's provision in 1996 that held that it was uh, criminal to transmit patently offensive uh, speech on the internet or indecent speech on the internet. Problem, they never defined what indecent was. So how are we supposed to know what it means? So vagueness has special force in the First Amendment field. And then also we are concerned about laws that impose a prior restraint on expression. It's something that happened in the civil rights movement where Southern officials would oftentimes not grant permits to Dr. King or um, Fred Shuttlesworth or other famous civil rights leaders, right? And what they often did was that these licensors engaged in unbridled discretion and exercised prior restraint on expression. Was well, Justice, uh, former Chief Justice Warren Berger said, prior restraints are the most serious infringement and least intolerable infringements on free expression. So that is my uh, overview of uh, First Amendment law. And um, I think that's been an hour or so. I didn't know if we could take some questions. Absolutely. Oh, uh, Great. Professor Great. Hudson, we have some questions. First of all, I. I want to thank you for a great uh, presentation that was so outstanding and clear and well organized. Uh, but uh, it's still you only have an hour, so it leaves it leaves rooms uh, for uh, for for a few questions. Uh, I'm going to try to petition Bob Lemming to get more time next time if I get another. Chance. Okay, well, we want to, we want you to have time. we want you to have more time. We have a series of questions about um, student speech and and teacher speech. But before we get uh, there, and of course uh, our audience is um, uh, 
in tune with those questions. We do have a questions about, about uh, Citizens United and uh, you know, uh, money being a form of speech. So the, here's the question, and maybe, it, maybe it's not a fair question, but the question is, could Citizens United have been uh, uh, um, uh, resolved the other way? In other words, um, you know, uh, not finding that money is a form of political speech and still have been consistent with First Amendment or free speech uh, jurisprudence? Would that Very, be yeah, very difficult question. Uh, first off, a couple points. Citizens United was a 5-4 decision. Uh, and it inspired a 30,000 word dissent from Justice John Paul Stevens. I think the, that uh, you could make cognizable arguments on either side. Um, to try to justify the majority opinion, uh, not that I'm saying I advocate for that, but let's talk about that for a moment. You have to go back to the court's first real speech decision in that area, Buckley v. Vallejo back in 1976. And it was in that case where the court did say that money was speech. Money was closer to speech than property. That when I, for example, contribute money to somebody, that is akin to me saying, I support such and such. Now, if you have that as your basic premise, that money is speech, then I think you can justify the result in Citizens United because what you had, according to Justice Kennedy in his majority opinion, was essentially discriminating against a speaker based on his corporate identity. I think the way to attack uh, Citizens United, one, may be to say the contribution of money or the spending of money is not always speech, that it is maybe closer to property. But I think it's traced back further back to the 19th century in determining how we treat corporations and are corporations truly persons uh, uh, within the meaning of constitutional law. And if you attack that concept about the corporation being a person, then certainly I think that you could reach a different result. But that has been one of the defining features of the Roberts Court is its deregulation of campaign finance reform. And there's a long litany of First Amendment decisions where the Roberts Court, usually on a, by a five to four layout, has struck down various restrictions on uh, campaign finance reform. Uh, excellent uh, response. In, in, has there ever been a case, and I, I just thought of this right now, but um, I, I guess one could make the argument though uh, that uh, the allowing uh, such dis disparities among uh, individuals or, um, or uh, PACs or whatever in terms of contributing to campaigns cr create, uh, creates an unequal system. So ha has, it, ha has free speech ever been tied to, uh, or the regulation of free speech, been tied to uh, kind of the equal protection clause and uh, that we're treating everyone uh, fairly and that we're not uh, unduly classifying, um, you know, uh, some uh, or regulating some segment of society and their, their speech. Yes, that was an attempted argument in the Arizona free enterprise system, right, where they're essentially saying that we're only going to allow certain public financing of political candidates, and we're not going to allow candidates to then inject more of their own money into the campaign. Um, and the majority of the Supreme Court rejected that, uh, saying that that is a sort of an unnecessary government regulation of pure political speech, and as such, we're not going to allow that. I do think that, though, in, in question to your larger point about equality and equal protection, I, I do think that we often see conflicts between liberty and equality in, in, in society. And so if, if you look at it from a very holistic perspective, anytime the government, let's say, prohibits discrimination, let's say, that is the government prohibiting individuals from discriminating. So there is this natural tension between liberty and equality in society. I will say at times, though, there's been nice synergy between the First Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. And I would point to Chicago Police Department versus Mosley, where the United States Supreme Court ruled that a, 
Chicago ordinance that prohibited Earl Mosley from engaging in racial discriminatory picketing was unconstitutional because it violated his equal protection rights because labor picketers could picket, but he couldn't picket on racial discrimination. So the court held it not only was an equal protection violation, but also a First Amendment violation. So when I file a First Amendment lawsuit, I filed a few of them. Um, I often will include an equal protection claim because my argument is a specific class of speakers is being treated worse. So that's so, uh, so that 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 gets me. In, and Bobby, this will be my last question, and then you can jump in. But kind of similar to that line of thinking, uh, Professor Hudson, is um, public school teachers uh, that. Um, you know, uh, want to um, um, be critical, we'll, we'll say, of their own school board. I mean, it happens a lot of places, right? Uh, whether it uh, happens uh, with regard to uh, salary increases or whatever decision the school board's making. Uh, what kind of, I mean, we have sort of the, the, um, the, 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 the kind of practical response I think that most teachers have is, gee, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, shake the waters up uh, too much because um, things might happen. But in terms of legal authority, uh, how much, and you kind of alluded to it earlier in terms of being a public employee and was it the yeah. Grassetti case uh, that, that you uh, talked about and so forth. So how much leeway do teachers have to, um, to uh, political speech, one of the most uh, you know, protected forms of speech, uh, and said another way, uh, how much power do their employers, school districts have in limiting their political speech? Great question. I'm glad you asked that because I, I gave kind of a surface uh, incomplete uh, explication of public employee free speech law. Your first point about a public school teacher who complains about the school board, that falls squarely within the court's seminal uh, public school teacher case, Pickering versus Board of Education back in 1968. Marvin Pickering was a teacher who criticized the school board's allocation of money vis-a-vis uh, -vis athletics and academics. And there the court held that Marvin Pickering had a First Amendment right to engage in speech on matter of public concern, how the school board spent its money. But crucial to the court's decision in Pickering, when incidentally it was written by Justice Thurgood Marshall, uh, was the fact that Marvin Pickering was not criticizing people that he worked with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what, frankly, what we're often seeing in public school employment uh, free speech cases is that if the public school teacher criticizes the distant school board or the superintendent, that's protected speech as long as the speech touches on a matter of public concern or importance. But when the public school teacher insults fellow teachers, insults students, or insults the principal, people that the public school teacher works with on a day to day basis, that negatively impacts close working relationships and often is viewed as too disruptive. Now, whether the uh, public school teacher can engage in political speech, they certainly should be able to as a citizen, right? You don't forfeit all of your rights as a public employee, but we're seeing a lot of cases recently where public school teachers have gotten in significant trouble and some have even been discharged for speaking very negatively about certain political groups in society. And there's been a concern by many in the community um, that, that that's negative toward uh, specific groups and classes of students. So honestly, I think public school teachers, uh, to be quite honest, they have to be very careful. And this goes for all public employees, but public school teachers need to be very careful what they post on social media. Saw a series of cases, for example, where public school teachers got, got on uh, Facebook and wrote things that were very critical of BLM, and lo and behold, they got disciplined for it. Bobby, uh, your turn. I could go on all night, uh, but uh, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, well, by the way, when I was in seventh grade in 1967 in Monterey, California, I had a teacher who had attended a draft card burning 
uh, on the uh, uh, Golden Gate Bridge, came back to school inspired and tried to organize a peace march with students and was fired uh, uh, really soon after that, uh, which was an interesting thing to live through as a kid. Well, why? Uh, what, what's going on? That obviously was political speech. But I'm, I want to talk about David, and I want you to, I really would want to hear you what you have to say about this whole 260 stuff and the idea of whether or not plat social media platforms are platforms or are they publishers? And what is that? And what, is, what are the implications for free speech when it comes to what we can post, what they can post, and maybe more importantly, what they can censor and not and, and choose to censor uh, or not? Are they, uh, you, you know, how, how's that all going to play out here? Great question. Uh, you know, what, what uh, Bob's referring to is, uh, and I alluded to it briefly, I think 47 USC Section 230. And what Section 230 essentially does is it gives uh, social media platforms immunity uh, for the speech created by third parties, right? So uh, in some of the early iteration of the cases, uh, people would sue ALL because, you know, let's say person A sues uh, AOL because person B has said some awful things about person A. Section 230 provides AOL with immunity there. That's what they're referring to with regard to Section 230 immunity. Now, the, the rationale behind Section 230 immunity was that we want to grow free speech on the internet. We don't want to stifle these social media uh, entities, and we don't want to necessarily punish them, right? So example, we don't want to, for example, punish the bookstore because there's one book in the bookstore that may have some obscenity in it, right? It's not fair. We want to, to further a policy that promotes freedom of expression in society. Why this has become so, I think, uh, such a political issue, a political hot button issue lately is because there are some that say that some of these social media platforms um, have gone beyond simply allowing other people to post material and they have become really expert content curators and they are engaging in censorship and they're, censor they're censoring certain political points of view. Um, now that's a hotly debated topic um, and whether they are engaged in censorship. And, and in fact, I think, uh, you know, I was reading something the other day where uh, Zuckerberg was getting criticized by both Republicans and Democrats. The Republicans criticized Facebook for censoring too many conservative viewpoints. And then a lot of the Democrats were upset that they didn't censor <laughs> some of these viewpoints enough. Um, so I don't know what's gonna happen. Obviously, ultimately it's Congress's decision whether to amend Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So I think ultimately it's going to depend on the people uh, exercising their uh, vote uh, and to see what the composition of uh, Congress is going to be. Um, if, if the Republicans happen to gain a, a, a greater uh, number in the House, certainly I, I think that you could, you could see more direct attempts at trying to amend uh, amend section 230. But I, I can understand the need. Now, I, I do sometimes feel some sympathy for a uh, person out there who's been smeared uh, by somebody else on the internet, right? Um, but the idea is that we're supposed to be, we're supposed to go after the actual smearer, not the right. intermediary who allowed the speech to be posted, right? So it's, it's a difficult question. It's one that I, that I think is not going to go away. Um, and I think it, it, there, there's a lot of debate now on, look, even if Facebook and Google and these entities aren't bound by the First Amendment, that was, that was one part of the Prager decision that the Ninth Circuit said, look, the state action doctrine applies and uh, YouTube and Google, they're not state actors, right? Um, but censorship is still bad. A lot of people think censorship is bad Right, so we, we do want to have a system where I think uh, that we do get a multiplicity of viewpoints, and if uh, if there truly is censorship, I think that is a problem. 
Well, let, let me, you know, I'm a, a huge advocate for non-censorship, but I want to push the boundaries of my own thinking for a second, because I like to say that, you know, it's easy to protect speech that I like. It's harder to protect speech that I abhor. All right. So let's push the limit for a second and say uh, somebody uh, is, is posting on Facebook or has a website that suggests, and I'm going to use as an example of an extremist group that really is out of bounds in my thinking in terms of what principles we live like in, in terms of the United States. I'm just going to suggest that if you say and believe uh, that African Americans, Jews, Catholics, uh, anybody that's not Aryan, uh, it, it shouldn't be in, shouldn't be here, or shouldn't be a part of anything. Does that speech? Uh, and I'm not overthrowing the, the government yet. I'm not going to make that mistake. But if I'm saying these things uh, that are really out of the bounds of the ideas of what most Americans believe, or 99% of Americans believe that you know, all men are created equal. It goes right against the Declaration of Independence. How can that speech be as certainly watched by the FBI or at least censored by a private company? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think it, well, it is. Uh, oftentimes, a, a certain truly hateful speech is censored. I think the question then becomes, you know, what what value do we protect the most, right? Uh, right? When you have certain hateful speech that subjugates groups of pe people, that's incredibly harmful. Um, and, um, you know, yeah. and, and we have to also keep in mind that a lot of these groups have, have used uh, social media as a great recruitment tool. Co correct. And they've expanded what, their membership. You, here's a, a what if. Do you think if Skokie was decided today, the idea that uh, the, the, the KKK can march through a Jewish neighborhood spouting out what most people would say is offensive speech, certainly to the people in the neighborhood, would that be just, which was sort of lauded as, see how far we go with free speech? We even allow Nazis to march through a Jewish neighborhood. See how free we are? Um, would, how do you think that would be decided today? Uh, the same, or would, 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 was there a chance that that might be going, well, that's just too, too, that's too far. That's if the it, line. It, yeah, if it came before the U.S. Supreme Court, I, I think it would be protected, but it would not be protected unanimously. I think there would be division on the court. It would not be a unanimous decision. And uh, if we look at even, yeah, and if it is protected, what would the dissent argument be? I think the dissent argument would be that, uh, that the, the speech is far too harmful uh, to certain groups of people. Um, that it could lead to a substantial disruption and incitement to violence. Because remember, we've had Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, post Skokie. Uh, right. And Charlottesville, Virginia was really, a, I think, a significant watershed moment in, uh, in modern day society. And, and you had the direct clash between um, different groups on each side. And, and, uh, and we had a death in the case, Heather, it was a Heather Heyer, I can't remember the name of the lady that lost her life there. But in light of a lot of these massive disturbances, I think an argument can be made that there, there would be a forecast of, of significant enough disruption, a clear and present danger, if you will, that perhaps uh, that might be decided differently. I still think it was decided correctly, if you ask me directly. Right. Um, but I am cognizant of Charlottesville, Virginia. I would recommend Rod Smola's book uh, about Charlottesville. Um, He's a great free speech theorist and has written him many books on the First Amendment, but um, he uh, really thinks quite deeply about this, about this very problem and um, talks about the Skokie case and Charlottesville, Virginia as well. Well, thanks, David. Is there any, um, Tommy, do you see any uh, questions that you want to check out and check in chat that somebody's got out there? I'm, I don't want to monopolize any more time. Well, Go let ahead. me just, uh, get, I have, have five a minutes. I have a bunch of questions, but I, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think from our teacher's point of view, Professor Hudson, they, they might be uh, interested in a little overview on student speech uh, on social media and, uh, you know, uh, the boundaries uh, about a public school regulating student speech on, on social media. Do, do you have a, 
I do. That is the great unsettled question in First Amendment law. I'm going to be sending to Bob and, and Mark and Thomas an article that I wrote for the Pennsylvania Journal of Constitutional Law, where I talk about unsettled questions in student speech law. Ooh. And the number one unsettled question in student speech law is exactly how far does the arm of school authority extend to off-campus uh, social media speech by students? Uh, frankly, at some point, we have to draw the line. There's, there's a, a case out of the Third Circuit in which the third U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that Tinker did not apply to social media student speech that uh, was created entirely off campus. That case has been appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, whether the court will grant cert or not, we don't know. What most courts are doing is they are applying what is known as the nexus test. So in direct answer to your question, you have to show, school officials have to show a clear nexus or connection between the off-campus social media speech by the student and something that happens at school. Ooh. If there is no nexus, then I think it's a matter either of parental discipline or a matter for law enforcement if it's uh, some type of threatening speech. If there is a nexus, then most courts are applying the Tinker Standard, which as you know, is reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. So the two tests that are used by the court are the courts are the nexus test and the so-called reasonable foreseeability test, which essentially what this boils down to is most courts are applying tinker. Uh, but in my opinion, there are certain instances where it's entirely divorced from the school. And if you can't show a clear nexus, even in the age of cyberbullying, you're gonna have to take, the school officials are gonna have to say hands off because otherwise, I think it's, uh, you know, as the Third Circuit said in the Justin Layshock case, it's a dangerous premise to allow school officials to reach in the home and start punishing students for stuff that, that happens at home. Gotcha. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, last thing, and maybe this will transition all of us to into the debate tonight. What, what about, um, what about uh, political speech that is... Uh, you know, and we have this on both sides, right? That is uh, supposedly intentionally ma malicious and, um, you know, uh, is, um, you know, picked up by social media and spread and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, does it make a difference whether or not the origins of that, that kind of malicious political, false, malicious, knowingly false, political speech uh, originates outside the United States or inside the United States? In other words, is it easier for the government to regulate that kind of foreign interference in our elections than it would be if it were homegrown? Great, uh, great uh, question. I'm actually going to be discussing that uh, October 29th at the Na uh, National Constitution Center uh, on another Zoom call. That's actually the subject is election disinformation speech and such. Um, the problem is when the state of Maryland tried to regulate that, a reviewing federal district court invalidated it on First Amendment free speech grounds. So I think it's, it's troubling, right? Because we have two principles coming at each other. Um, one of which, like we have this huge tradition of like unfettered protection for political speech and we want to let people decide what's their own best interest. It's better to let the people decide what's true and false and we don't want the government being too paternalistic and telling us what's true and false. On the other hand, as you've identified, right, there's certain types of speech that can be so false, so harmful and have such a damaging impact that it, that, it, that it really does cause such deep damage and fissures. And the honest answer to your question is that is a developing area of, of jurisprudence and laws are, are being crafted right now to try to address that problem. And um, that's one that uh, I, I really don't know what the end game is going to be on that. Um, I, you know, the, the Maryland's attempt was not successful, but that doesn't mean that there, there might be a more sort of narrowly tailored uh, way to, to address those, those harms. All right. 
Mark, you coming back? Well, there I is. think, yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hudson, for your uh, sharing your expertise tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I would just like to thank our sponsors, the Center for Civic Education, Kansas State University, the Johnson County First Amendment Foundation, and the Indiana Bar Foundation. Thank you so much to our sponsors. Uh, any, any final words, Bob? Uh, it was great, David, right, right on target, Thanks. succinct, straightforward. I think people got a lot of good information out of it. Uh, you know, you and, really, I wanted to tell you that you really changed my life uh, in, in a sense when you allowed me to do the We the People programs. Um, it really like opened up a whole new arena for me and I, I can't express my gratitude enough. And, and one other thing that you did was you really inspired a lifelong interest in the civil rights movement and Fred Shuttlesworth is you have one of the most powerful quotes I ever heard. You said, I want to keep teaching we the people and uh, until the name of Fred Shuttlesworth rings as, as, as mightily as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And that, that had a really profound impact on me. Well, yeah. David, I heard you mention him tonight, so I'll, I, I, I knew that was good. But I'll just, one thing, I never allowed you uh, to be involved <laughs> in the We the People program. I guess it was, a, it was a privilege <laughs> and on my <laughs> part and in the rest of the country and to get you involved in it. So thank you for your long time uh, service yeah. to the program uh, and what you do in, in daily life uh, with this. And hopefully we could do some more of these at some point on what, some other topics. Thanks so much. I really okay. appreciate it. All Thank right, you, Mark. That, good night, everybody. Have a great, uh, have a great uh, debate tonight. I'll see you guys later. Good night.